Melanesia pachydermatis is commonly encountered in dogs as a cause of superficial infections in warm, moist anatomical sites. Places like the interdigital skin, lips, ear canal, uh, groin, and skin fold. So skin fold dermatitis is a big one for sure. What you see is erythema, a greasy malodorous exudate, and discomfort. They're going to be itchy. With extensive and chronic lesions, we can also see lichenification and hyperpigmentation of the skin. These infections tend to have some seasonality to them and are generally more common in the warmer months. In this image here, you can see chronic otitis externa in a spaniel. Um, the tissues are thickened, they're hyperplastic. You can see just sort of how um, thickened the epithelium is and how closed off the ear canal appears. It's erythematous, so it's reddened, and you can see seborrhea. So this, this is going to be the malodorous exudate um, that really characterizes these infections. In this image, what you can see is lichenification, so thickening of the skin, which leads to this appearance that sort of resembles lichen, so which is where the name comes from. And this is a pathological change that can occur secondary to chronic pyoderma, so if it goes on for a long period of time. Treatment of these infections um, oftentimes relies on topical therapy. Um, for pyoderma, 2% myconazole and 2% chlorhexidine preparations have been used. Azole-containing shampoos and Burroughs solution um, is a good choice for treating otitis externa. Just like pyoderma and otitis associated with Staphylococcus pseudintermediates or pseudomonas or any bacterial pathogen, Identifying and controlling the underlying disease is critical. You can't simply kill the yeast. You have to understand what's going on in your patient that predisposes them to these infections in the first place. So are they atopic? Do they have food allergies and endocrinopathy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when dealing with challenging or refractory cases, consultation with a dermatologist is a good idea. Cryptococcus gadii is the most common systemic mycosis of cats, and cats are sort of disproportionately affected. It's eight times as common in them as it is in dogs. This is also a pathogen that we see emerging, or maybe it's already emerged um, in Canada. So starting back in 1999, uh, Cryptococcus gadii was identified on Vancouver Island, and more recently has been found in the, on the mainland as well, so in uh, the Vancouver coastal and Fraser Health regions. This is an organism that not only affects cats, but also people. So in this figure here from the British Columbia Centers for Disease Control, you can see the annual incidence of human cryptococcus gadii infections between 2003 and 2019, ranging between about 0.1 and 0.5 infections per 100,000 population. If we look at this in terms of number of infections per year, you can see that it ranges between 6 and 24 people who are affected. In cats, Cryptococcus gadii infections are most commonly involving the upper respiratory tract. So we see sneezing, mucopurulent nasal discharge, polyp-like masses, and fluctuant subcutaneous swelling on the bridge of the nose. We can also see neurological signs, so this infection can extend into the brain, and in these animals you'll see depression, changes in temperament, seizures, circling, head pressing, and vestibular disease, really just depending on where those lesions are occurring. Cryptococcus species are environmental organisms with a worldwide distribution, so gadii, as I said previously, tends to be associated with trees and soils, while Cryptococcus neoformans is associated with pigeon feces. In these images here, you can see some cats with cryptococcus infections on the head. Um, so on the left here, we have some swellings over the top of this cat's head. It's actually more typically on the bridge of the nose, but this gives you a good idea of what they can look like. And then on the right, we have a cat with inflammation of the lip and ulceration of the lip as well, caused by cryptococcus. These infections can also progress into the central nervous system. So on the left here, we have a cat's brain with areas of liquefaction necrosis, um, some of which are indicated by these arrows. And you can imagine the neurological signs that may be associated with, with these lesions. And then on the right, we have 
uh, an impression smear, so a nasal imprint, a slide was simply pressed up against the lesion on the bridge of a cat's nose um, and stained to reveal the presence of these cryptococcus organisms. So here's our yeast and its large capsule surrounding it. Treatment of cryptococcus gadii infections in cats relies on azole antifungals. So itraconazole, fluconazole, and boriconazole are all suitable options. Um, amphotericin B can also be added. In addition to antifungal chemotherapy, physical removal of infectious burden is important. So surgical excision of fungal affected tissues and traumatic flushing can also be used. This is a treatment that requires a lot of patience. Long-term therapy is required. Um, it's reported to take up to two years. And in cats who are FELV, FIV positive, they may need to be treated with antifungals indefinitely. So you need to have dedicated owners who are willing to pay for these medications for a long period of time. In people, cryptococcus most often infects the lungs or central nervous system. Pulmonary disease is characterized by cough, chest pain, and fever. And cryptococcal meningitis is characterized by headache, fever, neck pain, and nausea. Cryptococcus neoformans is most commonly identified in people who have pre-existing conditions. So it seems to be less virulent, less able to cause disease unless you have a good reason to get sick. So people like AIDS patients, those who have received organ transplants, or are on other immunosuppressive therapies. Cryptococcus gadii um, is more likely to affect otherwise healthy individuals. And just like treating cats, treating cryptococcus infections in people requires long-term therapy, so oftentimes greater than six months. These are some figures from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control that try and summarize the burden of cryptococcus infections. Uh, on the left in this histogram, you can see the global burden of HIV-related cryptococcal meningitis, so Sub-Saharan Africa is the region of the world where we have the highest number of these infections, over 700,000 annually. And then on the right, within Sub-Saharan Africa, we can see that cryptococcus is responsible for approximately half a million deaths a year. So a very high burden um, associated with, with these infections globally. When identifying these organisms, if candida is suspected, scrapings, biopsies of affected tissues and formalin, or milk in the case of mastitis should be sent to the diagnostic lab. For malassezia, cytological examination of exudates can be very, very helpful. This can be either an ear swab or a, a skin scraping. Um, we can also use the tape strip method to just touch a, a piece of transparency tape um, to the lesion and look at that microscopically. And also biopsies, particularly for deep pyoderma or in chronically affected animals. For cryptococcus, tissues for histopathology, cerebral spinal fluid, or any tissues or fluids that can be collected from lesions or exudates. Cryptococcus has a potentially quite broad host range, and you can see in this image on the right here, uh, this is a tissue section of a lung from a skink, so a lizard, uh, that had granulomatous pneumonia. And I think you can appreciate these large uh, uh, yeast-like organisms surrounded by their capsules, very classical uh, for cryptococcus. Once the lab has your samples, candida can be identified based on its colony appearance on culture or microscopically. Uh, Malassezia pachydermatis can also be identified using microscopy. Um, as you can see again here on the right, we have uh, cytology from a canine ear swab with abundant yeast-like organisms that look just like malassezia. They have that bottle or bowling pin shape. We can also culture malassezia. And then for cryptococcus, most often it would be identified microscopically. So either doing microscopy on clear fluids or staining using India ink. Cryptococcus species are potentially zoonotic, although they're not generally spread between individuals who are sick. So our big risk here comes as a laboratory-acquired infection. So if you suspect that one of your patients is infected with cryptococcus, make sure to tell the lab so that they can handle your samples safely. Malassezia pachydermatis is really not a frequent human pathogen. It has been rarely reported. Um, so this is a, a case report of granulomatous skin disease and a person who owned a dog suggesting zoonotic transmission. Um, but not a huge concern. I probably wouldn't bring a dog into a, 
a neonatal intensive care unit for therapeutic purposes, but other than highly susceptible patient populations, it's unlikely to cause issues. And then candida infections are generally not considered zoonotic. We get infections from our own endogenous strains. Treatment of these yeast infections really depends on where your infection is. Is it something that can be treated topically or do you require systemic therapy? For candida, oftentimes they're topical and therapy is a range of topicals and systemic therapy. So nystatin orally, azoles, plus or minus amphotericin B. For malassezia, oftentimes topical infections treated topically with shampoos, other topical medications, um, and azole antifungals. For cryptococcus, these are always systemically treated, um, generally starting with fluconazole. If that fails, then itraconazole, uh, plus potentially amphotericin B. Have just a couple of new terms for today, and then of course some questions for self-assessment. Mm -hmm.